Numerous historical and current events are seen as steps in an ongoing plot to achieve world domination through secret political gatherings and decision-making processes. This is also true. Prior to the 1990s, the New World Order conspiracyism was limited to two American countercultures, primarily the militantly anti-government right and secondarily fundamentalist Christians concerned with end-time emergence of the Antichrist. Things have changed. People are waking up. There are skeptics such as Michael Barkin and Chip Burlett who have expressed concern that right-wing conspiracy theories about a new world order have now not only been embraced by many left-wing conspiracy theorists, but have seeped into popular culture, thereby inaugurating an unrivaled period of people actively preparing for the apocalyptic millennium scenarios in the United States of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. I believe it's more about freedom. I believe it is more about liberty. For without liberty, it is the end times. We have the Constitution, we have the Bill of Rights, and we have the Declaration of Independence. This is our country. We can take it back. One patriot at a time. Our rights shall not be infringed. Quote, these political scientists warn that this mass hysteria may not only fuel lone wolf terrorism, but have a devastating effect on American political life, such as the far right wooing the far left into joining a revolutionary third position movement capable of subverting the established political powers. That is the exact purpose of this film. To raise awareness to the evils of the New World Order to expose their lies and treachery. These oligarchs have but one intention, total world domination. The oligarchs' plan is to unify North America under a common currency, end the sovereignty of the United States, Mexico, and Canada, and institute a global government, surveil our every move, track our every action. This is slavery. Delivered with a box of roses. Wake up. Beware the thorns. Woodrow Wilson and Winston Churchill use the term New World Order to refer to a new period in history evidencing a dramatic change in world political thought and the balance of power after World War I and World War II. They saw a new sense of collective efforts to identify, understand, or address worldwide problems that go beyond the capacity of individual nation-states to solve. These proposals led to the creation of international organizations such as the United Nations and NATO, and international regimes such as the Bretton Woods system and general agreements on tariffs and trades which were calculated both to maintain a balance of power. They were to regulate cooperation between nations in order to achieve a peaceful phase of capitalism. Peaceful phase? It appears everything that they say is exactly the opposite that they do. Make war, speak peace, help the economy, destroy the economy. This is the New World Order. In the aftermath of the horrible Oklahoma City bombing, government propagandists tried to intimidate the people into silence by recklessly linking criticism of the government to acts of murder. Some people ask, how can you fear your government and claim to love your country? Our response is, how can you love your country without fearing your government? Who else holds a counterfeit license to kill, incarcerate, and confiscate for non-crimes? Remember, America is about liberty first and last, not obedience to bureaucrats. The Washington power clique wants you to shut up, get in line, do what you're told to do, and most outrageously, think what you've been told to think. We have hundreds of politicians and thousands of lobbyists crawling all over Washington, thinking of ways to control you, to extend their will over you, to subvert your freedom and replace it with their will, to capture, that is, to steal, your life force. And so we should all be very angry. 
because anger is the engine that drives our will to resist. And without resistance, without awareness, they will take it all. That's not just politically perverse. It's a sin against mankind because freedom is actually sacred. It is perfectly possible for a man to be out of prison and yet not free, to be under no physical constraint and yet to be a psychological captive, compelled to think, feel and act as the representatives of the national state or of some private interest within the nation wants him to think, feel and act. The nature of psychological compulsion is such that those who act under constraint remain under the impression that they are acting on their own initiative. The victim of mind manipulation does not know that he is a victim. To him, the walls of his prison are invisible, and he believes himself to be free. That he is not free is apparent only to other people. His servitude is strictly objective. Aldous Huxley Brave New World Revisited, 1958. In 1790, Amschel Rothschild stated, Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. In 1791, the Rothschilds get their wish. The control of a nation's money, our nation, through their agent Alexander Hamilton, a member of George Washington's cabinet, the Rothschilds set up a central bank in the United States called the First Bank of the United States, established with a 20-year charter. In 1811, the Rothschild's First Bank of the United States charter ran out, and Congress voted against its renewal. Nathan Meyer Rothschild was enraged. He stated, Either the application for renewal of the First Bank of the United States is granted, or the United States will find itself embroiled in a most disastrous war. The United States and President James Madison stood firm and the charter for the First Bank of the United States was not renewed. Nathan Rothschild then issued another threat. Let's teach those impudent Americans a lesson. Bring them back to colonial status. In 1812, backed by the Rothschild money and Nathan Rothschild's orders, the British declare war on the United States. The Rothschild's plan was to cause the United States to build up such a debt in fighting the war that they would have to yield and allow the charter of the First Bank of the United States to be renewed. In 1816, the United States Congress passed a bill permitting another Rothschild-dominated central bank, which once again gives the Rothschilds control of the American money supply. They broke our back, and they're breaking it again. This bank is called the Second Bank of the United States, and it's given a 20-year charter. So, thousands of British and American soldiers dead later, the Rothschilds get their bank. In 1832, President Andrew Jackson runs the campaign for his second term of office under the slogan, Jackson and No Bank. Jackson planned to take control of the money system to benefit the American people, not further enrich the profiteering Rothschilds. In 1833, President Jackson starts removing the government deposits from the Rothschild-controlled Second Bank of the United States and deposits the funds into banks directed by Democratic bankers. This angered the Rothschilds to panic, and they contract the money supply, causing a depression. President Jackson, aware of their agenda, later states, You are a den of thieves and vipers, and I intend to rout you out, and by eternal God I will rout you out. On January 30, 1835, an assassin tried to shoot President Andrew Jackson, but fortunately, both of the assassin's shots misfired. Jackson later claimed he knew the Rothschilds were responsible for the assassination attempt. In 1836, following years of battles against the Rothschilds and their central bank, President Andrew Jackson finally succeeds in routing out the Rothschilds when the Second Bank of the United States Charter is not renewed. They lost the battle, but the war is not over. It rages on and on, through the years, through the decades, and through the centuries. In 1861, President Abraham Lincoln approached the big banks in New York to try and obtain loans to support the American Civil War. As these large banks were heavily influenced by the Rothschilds, they offered Lincoln a deal they knew he could not accept. 24 to 36 percent interest on all monies loaned. 
the gangster banksters in action once again. Angered by the high rate of interest, Lincoln decides to print debt-free money through the Department of Treasury and informs the public that this money is now legal tender for all debts, public and private. By April 1862, $449,338,902 worth of Lincoln's debt-free currency had been printed and distributed into circulation. Lincoln stated, We gave the people of the Republic the greatest blessing they ever had, their own paper money, to pay their own debts. In 1863, Lincoln learns that Tsar Alexander II of Russia was refusing the Rothschild's attempt to set up a central bank in Russia. In a surprise move, the Tsar issued orders that if England or France actively interferes with the American Civil War to help the South, Russia would consider such an action a declaration of war, and that he would side with Lincoln. To further emphasize his point, Tsar Alexander II sent part of his fleet to ports in both San Francisco and New York. On November 21, 1864, President Lincoln, in a letter to Colonel William F. Elkins, wrote, and I quote, I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned, and an era of corruption in high places will follow, and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people. Until all the wealth is aggregated in a few hands, and the republic is destroyed. In early 1865, in an address to Congress, Lincoln stated, I have two great enemies, the Southern Army in front of me and the financial institutions in the rear. Of the two, the one in the rear is my greatest foe. During the Republican National Convention in 1880, a compromise was struck to nominate former minister and elder for the Church of Christ, James A. Garfield of the party's half-breed faction. Chester A. Arthur, former collector for the Port of New York, was chosen to be Garfield's running mate to satisfy the Stallworths faction. Senator Roscoe Conkling, who had mentored Chester A. Arthur since the late 1860s and had granted him a $10,000 a year tax commission post, was not consulted by Garfield about the appointment of William H. Robertson as collector of the Port of New York. Conkling, along with fellow New York State Senator Thomas C. Platt, resigned. Conkling tried to force the Republican majority of the New York State Legislature to re-elect him, affirming his status as the New York Republican leader, but was successfully blocked by the half-breed faction, and Conkling's congressional career ended. The squabble consumed the Garfield presidency, overshadowing promising activities such as Postmaster General James' investigation of the Star Route postal frauds and Secretary of Treasury William Wyndham's successful refinancing of the federal debt. On June 19, 1881, President James A. Garfield stated to Congress, Whoever controls the volume of money in our country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. And when you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled one way or another by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. 